My name is Dolan Malna, and 2018 was honestly kind of a miserable year in terms of personal accomplishment. Real life stuff kept me spinning my wheels most of the year, and I wasn't able to pick myself up until the very end of 2018. Consequently, this year in gaming was filled with a lot less quality and a lot more quantity. As a result, I think the wisest use of my time is just to make another podcast-style end-of-year video like last year. Well, that might be the wisest use of my time, but I'm not going to do that. If I'm going to make these videos, I'm going to do it right. Let's kick this pig! First things first, let's get the bit players out of the way. These are the games that love them or hate them. I just didn't have a lot to say. Sure is a fighting game. I don't really like fighting games. Pixel art is pretty, though. Overflowing with creativity, this quarter muncher is a blast from start to finish on the Switch's emulation. The multiple paths offer it a great deal of replay value, and the ability to play it with friends makes it twice as fun. Highly recommended for someone looking for a short and cheap game with lots of replayability. This game feels like something out of a dream. I have vague memories of shapes and moving colors, but it basically left no impact on me. I think I paid three bucks for it, though, and it kept me entertained for like five hours or whatever, so I guess that's cool? This game just flat out doesn't work. Most of it's filled with obvious beta assets, and I got 20 minutes in before a critical flag refused to trip, and I was soft-locked and kept from proceeding. The fact that this is a product people can pay money for is absolutely baffling to me. Alright, bonus rapid round. Multiplayer focused games, go! Sadly, this is just a confounding, confusing, near-unplayable mess of a fighting game, which sucks, because any game where I can make Shovel Knight and Gunvolt fight ought to be amazing. I hop back into Minecraft with some friends after a long time, and, well, it's Minecraft. There's an almost unlimited world of things to do, and it's only as fun as the friends you play it with, if you ask me. Thankfully, I got to play it with some real great friends. Zara, Dwai, Meow, and all of Zion made that place feel like home for a little bit. And getting to see Zara and Dwai form a relationship while playing it made the entire thing worthwhile. But I still hold the game itself as more of a canvas than an actual game. Kinda hard to rate because of that, you know? Similar to Overwatch from last year, I got to play this game with friends. I really did enjoy the time I spent on it, but the lack of local multiplayer made it basically obsolete when Smash came out. It's always a fun time when I bothered to hop on, but it didn't really grab my interest like Overwatch did. When I first started playing this with my family, I thought it was going to be my favorite Mario Party of all time. But after about six games, I realized just how little content there is. Virtually no online, a surprisingly small amount of video games, only four maps! Honestly, while I played it enough to enjoy with my family, I kind of feel like I got ripped off. But it filled the time before Smash, so I can't say I entirely regret it. I just wish it had been a little bit more... substantial. This little game was the sleeper hit for Gaming Nights on Zion. It really brought a ton of people together for nights of free-to-play fun. Until it stopped being free-to-play. The mass appeal of having everyone from the server hop on for a giant round is totally lost under the new system and as a result, I have to lower the score. At its best, it's Mafia Madness with all your friends online, but right now it's just a gated community of people who can't move on. It's really sad to see it die like this. Celeste was so much fun, I decided to get the studio's other game, Towerfall. It's fairly fun in short bursts, but suffers from the fatal flaw of not being Smash. It can lead to frantic and simple to understand gameplay sessions, but even before Smash came out, it didn't really hold my group's interest for that long. If you can get it on the cheap, it's probably worth your time, but it largely made a non-impression on me and my friends. This one's pretty silly and a lot of fun. The requirements to get new levels are a little insanely tight, to the point it becomes less fun and more like a job at times, but when everything goes right, it can be an absolute blast. We never played for long, but my family always finds itself coming back to it at least twice monthly to snag a couple more stars. I mean, I got this for one dollar, and I appreciate that in multiplayer you can completely break the puzzles, but this is really nothing more than a chuckle-worthy time waster. I spent 70 bucks on this game, and I'm honestly ashamed of myself. It was really fun for a couple of weeks because myself and a friend of mine were about the same skill setting, and so there was a real sense of back and forth when we played, but this game is just the barest bones definition of a fighter. The story is so nothing that even for a fighting game, it's embarrassing. There are no interesting extra modes, and the sprite quality varies wildly from the in-birth characters looking like PS1 models to the Ruby characters being some of my favorite sprite art of the year. 
It was stupid fun while it lasted, but it didn't last long. Thankfully, all the DLC I got this year wasn't as disappointing as Cross Tag Battle. So for the next bit, I want to talk about the DLC I went through this year, as well as some older games that I replayed in 2018. I already did a review on this game, so I'll put a card at the top right if you want my more complete thoughts on Freedom Planet, but to hit the keynotes here, Freedom Planet isn't just the best 2D Sonic game, it's the Mega Man X to the classic Mega Man. It takes all the aspects from its inspiration and improves on them. The writing's just fun, the level design is some of the best I've seen in gaming, and the re-release on the Switch is just the excuse I need to beat it all again. I love everything about this game, and if you enjoy any sort of 2D platformer from Sonic to Gunstar, you won't regret picking this bad boy up. What more can I say? Gunvolt is as good as ever. The Switch ports are THE definitive editions of these games. Both are overflowing with style and charm, and they have great level design that complements the gameplay, and shockingly engaging stories. This is everything Mega Man wishes it could be. There's a reason Gunvolt has appeared on these lists before. It's because it's amazing and stupidly cheap for what you're getting. If you enjoy tight action platformers like Mega Man, both of these are a must buy. This was the first Resident Evil game I ever finished, and replaying it taught me two things. First, that it's a great game that balances action and horror well, and keeps up a great and entertaining pace. Second, it's not nearly as replayable as many others in the series. My original intent was to 100% it, but there are so many missions and goals that involve repeating the same content over and over again without any real changes. I definitely got my money's worth and consider this a fantastic game, but I just couldn't 100% it. After the fourth time beating it without any meaningful gameplay changes, I decided that was enough for me. But any game I can beat four times in a row and still enjoy is something really special. If you want a budget Resident Evil with an entertaining, well-paced story and simple to understand gameplay with a few thrills and scares, I cannot recommend this one enough. Unfortunately, its sequel just doesn't hold up as well. In fact, I think it might be my least favorite Resident Evil game. That being said, there's still a lot of fun to be had, but like, every other game in the series has at least one standout feature or, or moment that sets it apart from the rest. But this just sort of... is the most by-the-numbers cheap-feeling Resident Evil title that's made it into the main canon. It lacks the fluid zip and sizzle present in the crazy multiplayer action of 6, and it certainly isn't a competent horror title in any sense. Even 5 had that amazing last chapter with Wesker. This? It has some fun callbacks and a relatively interesting plot development, but it really does end up feeling like filler in both gameplay and story. If you're already a giant Biohazard fan like I am, and have a friend to play through it, you can do much worse, but it is offensively unremarkable compared to the rest of the series it hails from. On a more positive note, I ran through all the Biohazard 7 DLC when it went on sale again, and man, that was a blast. Were most of the modes things that literally any other Resident Evil would have included in the base game? Yes! Does this mean that 7 has objectively less content at launch bundled in than any other Resident Evil other than the first or second game? Yes! Is this a bad thing? Absolutely, freaking lootly but I don't care. I got it for cheap, and the packs were fun enough for me to not regret the time or money spent on it. Nothing so crazy fun as to keep me coming back again and again and again like the Merc mode in Resi 6, but fun enough that I played through each mode at least once and really enjoyed it. They even put in a real ending to the game with the end of Zoe DLC. The story was dumb as a sack of bricks, but it was really honestly nice to see Zoe's art get an actual resolution. I kinda went on a mega marathon, replaying the original 4X titles, and while this was actually my first time through X3, I wanted to keep them all together for consistency's sake. So no more mega mincing words, let's talk about the first X collection. Mega Man redefined platformers in the NES era, but by 1993, no less than six titles had come out on the NES. The system in the series had been pushed to its absolute limit, and stagnation had finally begun to set in. I cannot overstate how much of a breath of fresh air Mega Man X is to the series. Finally, you have the mobility to make platforming creative and expressive, and the weapons have real utility outside of just damaging bosses. Now, to be fair, giving you the option to choose something other than Chill Penguin at first and miss the dash boots is a huge oversight, but as long as you know to go there first, the game is perfectly playable without a guide. While Mega Man would continue to improve in the future, this is the first time I consider him to be really fully and actually good, you know, finally living up to the potential he always had. Unfortunately, Mega Man X2 was not the game to really meaningfully improve on the Mega Man formula. In fact, I would argue this is a perfect case of one step forward, two steps back. The X-Hunters really add nothing of value, but they also don't detract much from the core gameplay loop either. 
What does detract from the previous games are the stage designs. X2 has such a huge reliance on instant crushing deaths and non-telegraph secrets. In simple terms, this means the levels rely a lot more on trial and error than previously. Now, the base is still good enough to make this game fun, but if you ask me, it's noticeably inferior in quality to the first one. If Mega Man X2 was one step forward, two steps back, X3 is one step backwards, 50 feet off a cliff. This game is a jumbled mess of incoherent features that just get in the way of what's actually fun about Mega Man. While not quite as instant death heavy, the level design remains uninteresting and uninspired for the most part. The music takes a serious hit, and for the first time in a Mega Man game, it's just grating. This feels more like a bloated fan game than a real Mega Man X title, and given the rumors that Capcom outsourced the majority of the development, that makes a little too much sense. Thankfully, you can only wall jump up from here. Mega Man X4 is the first Mega Man game I ever played, and it made me fall in love with the series. The presentation bounces the gambit from compellingly charming to incompetently campy, and I love it all. The gameplay finally broke from the insane clutter of X2 and 3, and streamlined it back down to utter perfection. The inclusion of Zero as a playable character is the first real addition that felt substantive, and while the levels do feel slightly more geared towards Zero than X, they strike a wonderful balance that makes it great to play through as both Zero and X. The cutscenes are almost incomprehensible, but the story they're attempting to tell is genuinely interesting if you're willing to dig a little deeper. What more can I say? X4 is a treat from start to finish, and I can't recommend it enough. Before we go, I want to discuss the overall package of the X Collection. As a port job, I can't give it more than a 3 out of 5. The rather noticeable input lag, especially in the SNES titles, and the lack of save states or rewind, and the weird aspect ratio pixel crunching requirements, and lack of any real unlockables make this just a so-so port job. The X Challenge is a cluster screw of a mess that requires a lot more luck than skill, and offers very little in the way of an interesting challenge. The art gallery is cool enough, some of the medals were fun, and some of the others felt kind of arbitrary and grindy. The one advantage this collection has is being on the Switch, which allows you to play these quality platformers, and X3, on the go. Otherwise, I suggest standard emulation of the X Collection for the GameCube or PS2 over this. If you can't easily get either of those and just want to play the X series on the go, I can confirm it's worth the buy. This one's kind of interesting, as it's both DLC and a replay at the same time. Sonic Mania Plus came out on the Switch physically, and if that isn't a reason to rebeat it, I don't know what is. While Mania Mode is fairly meh, the two new characters are well worth the 5 bucks alone, and the other free updates with the bosses made me really enjoy revisiting this game. Mania plays a lot more like a best of classic Sonic, but given the state the blue blur is in, I think that's exactly what we needed. I would love to see a Sonic game made by the same team with a little more original content, but as it stands, there's very little not to love in Mania or its plus DLC. Continuing on the DLC train, I finally got around to completing all the Mystic Messenger DLC available in 2018. While I don't think any of it held a candle to the main plot, it was really nice to see everyone again. Though it didn't make me care much for Unknown or V, it did make me care more about Jumin, which I thought was a near impossible feat. When all's said and done, it's just nice to get more Mystic Messenger. While I didn't care for the non-canon Christmas stuff at all, it just felt fan y and everyone was either off-model or out of character. The Valentine's epilogues, however, were just really, really great. I had high hopes for Torna, the Golden Country, perhaps impossibly high. As a follow-up to 2017's excellent Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it had a lot to live up to. And while the resulting DLC doesn't quite live up to the heights the base game reached, it's still an absolute joy to play. Its danger as a prequel means that a lot of the narrative stakes are muted, and there isn't exactly room for interesting plot twists like the main game offers in this DLC. Even more disappointing, it intentionally veers away from answering some of the more interesting questions that could be solved by examining this time period. But where it falls short in terms of plot, Torna makes up in spades with character. The real draw of Xenoblade 2 was never the plot anyway, but how the plot could facilitate interesting character dynamics, and thankfully, Torna hits home just as hard as the base game. Also thankfully, the gameplay has been tweaked just enough to keep it feeling interesting and engaging while still feeling like Xenoblade. And it didn't leave me as blown away as before, I still smiled the whole time I played it, and I'm sure to revisit it sooner rather than later. I also beat other games! Look, I don't know what to do with these, theming was hard this year, okay? First up on this list is the first game I beat this year. 
Detention starts off strong, but stops being a game and becomes a bit more of an art project after Chapter 1. I highly recommend it if you think the idea of bring your own interpretation is the height of storytelling. But for the rest of us, it's a pretty standard, it was all in purgatory story, with the only real twist being that it takes place in Taiwan. If you want a little more depth, I highly recommend the Gaming Brits video on it. I'll readily admit that I'm probably harsher on this game than I ought to be. When I originally beat it, I gave it a 3 out of 5, but the longer I thought about it, the more I realized I was just trying to ignore what I really felt about it, and dadgummit, this is my show. Mario Odyssey is a perfectly functional, yet formulaic and lifeless Mario sequel. My disappointment comes with how it builds itself. It promised to be the return of interconnected 3D worlds with multiple ways to complete objectives. Instead, it gave us a hub devoid of anything meaningful to do, filled with one-off objectives and the simple and most boring way to complete them usually being the fastest. The core problem with Mario Odyssey is twofold. One, there are a billion tiny objectives, but almost none of them amount to any kind of meaningful challenge that lasts longer than 90 seconds. Because of this, they can't grow in complexity and all feel about as simple and dull as collecting blue coins in Mario Sunshine. The second is the capture mechanic. As cool as it is in concept, I feel it really runs completely counter to the platforming moveset Mario uses most of the time. Controlling enemies in Odyssey is about as mechanically engaging as waggle mechanics in Mario Galaxy, and oh gosh, those are back to why? Sunshine's gimmick at least flowed pretty perfectly with Mario's moveset, but this just doesn't work for me. It just has an over-linear design as well as an over-reliance on motion control quick-time events for me. It's a perfectly functional game, but I personally can't think of a single thing it does better than its predecessors, and the fact that it was billed as a sequel to 64 or Sunshine just felt deceptive to me. I absolutely loved this game at first, and I was super excited to play it with my friends and family. Turns out I'm the only person in my group that enjoys Tetris or Poyo Poyo, and no one will play it with me. Well, fine then, I'll just play single player mode. Except pretty early on, it gets so impossibly difficult that I don't even have half a chance of completing the levels. The difficulty curve in this game is just a straight line up after three levels. As a result, it just kind of sits collecting virtual dust on my virtual shelf. Gungeon is a game that gets really fun, about 40 hours in. It's severely balanced around late game items that don't show up until you've put in a ridiculous amount of time into the game. Once you have enough in the pool of weapons, the odds that you'll be dealt a hand that will allow you to reasonably finish the game becomes bearable. But is it worth 40 hours of unfun gameplay to get to the point where you can actually enjoy it? For me, I guess it was a very slim yes, but I don't think I could recommend this to anyone. There was enough fun to make me not regret my time and money spent, but little more than that. I was never really a classic Vania fan, but this game almost won me over. On the one hand, it's very rigid in its design, but on the other, it does so much with that. I don't have a lot more to say about it other than if you liked classic Castlevania, you'll likely love this. I'm not really a fan of such stiff platformers, but it was still presented well enough for me to enjoy my time with it. Inti creates somehow at it again, taking NES games I usually would feel meh about and making enjoyable little games out of them. This is a bit of an odd one, since the remake of this game is one of my favorites ever. Coming back to the original was a mix of feeling nostalgic and yet oddly underwhelmed. This game was absolutely revolutionary when it hit the market, and remains a competent survival horror game to this day. Sadly, and that's about all it is. Competent. There's virtually nothing about this game that wasn't 100% superannuated by the remake. Every set piece, zombie, gun, and story beat is just plain better, and nothing is missing. Resident Evil is actually still a really good game, even by today's standards, but every moment I was playing it, I couldn't help but ask myself, why would I play this instead of Remake? Now, apart from historical curiosity, I couldn't think of a single reason. Well, that and one other thing. But just take a look at this. It's Forest. Oh my god. It's awful. Never mind, this game is a 10 out of 10 legendary. I honestly never knew tweening could look so good. Mechanically, Half Genie Hero is just okay, but the level of absolute charm oozing from every corner brings it up tremendously. The art, the dialogue, the music, all of it helps keep me smiling while playing through some of the less than perfect sections. My one actual complaint is the crazy amount of repeating content. There are like five levels in the entire game, and the main story alone forces you to replay each of them at least once to finish it. And then every single DLC campaign after that makes you replay the same levels again with virtually no alterations. About my fifth time through the same levels, I just stopped. I highly recommend the base game, but if you ask me, skip the DLC and just get the base game if possible. 
I got my money's worth on the main game alone, but the DLC felt pretty solidly like it was wasting my time. People complain that point-and-click adventure novels are barely games, and the Dark Side Chronicles isn't exactly helping their defenders. There's never a chance to do anything creative or interesting. The puzzles are also blindingly obvious as to be sleep-inducing, and that's when they aren't bugging out so hard that I have to reset the entire chapter to get them working again. That happened twice, by the way. The lack of touchscreen integration on the Switch is basically criminal, and despite being so simple, the interface is really unintuitive. All that aside, the game does have a couple moments of chuckle-worthy dialogue, and even if it is barely a game, it's short enough to be mostly inoffensive. When I initially played this game, I rated it a 3, but upon writing this review, I changed it to a 2. Even if it is mostly inoffensive, I can't think of a single thing this game does that isn't done better elsewhere. This is probably my favorite example of a horror game that only allows you to run and hide in the closet. While these gameplay mechanics certainly rob the game of any real sense of horror, its aesthetic lends it to a Tim Burton-esque sense of quirky unease. But at least it does what it sets out to do competently, and with some style. If you end up playing it, keep an eye out for the endgame. When the map becomes torn, watch out. When you return to the cafeteria at this point, it's a point of no return and can keep you from getting the true ending. Be sure to keep a save before the map goes wonky if you want to go back and forth and search for pieces of the true ending. This is an arbitrary point of no return intended to force a second playthrough if you get caught by it. Don't fall for it. I really like the Zelda series, so much that I've made an effort to play every mainline Zelda, and the last two I have to beat before this becomes a reality are the Oracle games, and this year I beat Oracle of Ages. I did not like Oracle of Ages. It's crazy, because I remember loving this game as a kid, but as an adult it absolutely infuriated me. The entire game is themed around puzzles, and I hate to say it, but these are some of the series' worst. A good puzzle is when you're given a situation that contains a clue indicating what you should do next. This game's idea of puzzles is to drop you in a giant map and expect you to use every tool on everything until something happens to work. That's not a puzzle, it's just busy work. When hints do exist in this game, they're often intentionally misleading, to the point where they tell you to go in the opposite direction of what will actually progress the story. Other times it will suddenly expect you to utilize a new mechanic that it never told you existed within the game. Did you know that you could bounce seeds off of wall? Nothing in the game indicates you can until a random puzzle requires it. It's not like you're locked in a small room first and forced to realize that the shooter can do this. And why does the sixth dungeon require you to use time travel to complete it when none of the other ones do? This isn't signposted anywhere, you're just supposed to intuit that this specific dungeon uses a mechanic that up to this point has been explicitly drilled into your mind over the course of five other dungeons that it will only work in the overworld. It's still a Zelda game, and despite being a Game Boy Color game, I really enjoy the art direction, but I suggest just watching a playthrough of this. Unless you enjoy mind-numbing trial and error, you'll just end up using a guide to get through it anyway, so save yourself the trouble and watch someone else who already knows where all the arbitrary keys are, and just enjoy the nice art design. If you want a review from someone who did enjoy this game a lot more than I did, I highly recommend King K's retrospective on the game. Just because it wasn't for me doesn't mean it won't be for you, and if you want a second opinion, I really suggest checking it out. Metroid Prime was one of my favorite games of all time, so I was super excited to jump straight into 2. Unfortunately, due to a series of coincidences, I kept losing my files about two hours in. I got so fed up I just decided to leave it behind. Until now. Starting it up, I was excited. The intro sets up a strong feeling of mystery and heft, as Federation soldiers are mowed down by Dark Samus and other shadowy creatures seemingly at her control. Soon after, I was greeted by the only conscious denizen of the planet, Illuminoth. He informed me that as Samus, I had to break into the enemy strongholds and steal back the planet's energy to save them from the forces of darkness. <laughs> Dope. What followed were about 15 hours of the least interesting Metroid gaming I have ever subjected myself to. The Ing are somehow less interesting than the Space Pirates and make even less sense from a lore perspective. The Luminoth lore is almost an exact copy-paste of the Chozos, except less fleshed out by the nature of being less interesting since they have no personal connection to Samus or the wider effect on the Metroid universe. And there are a ton of these little inconsistencies that would be easy to fix, but just aren't. Like, why are you collecting Chozo artifacts on a planet the Chozo have never interacted with? How do the Ing have a military and culture if they just came into existence, like, a week ago? Why don't the Luminoth just wake up the other Luminoth to help fight off this world-ending crisis rather than just waiting on Samus? 
why is Dark Samus one of the worst villains in all of Metroid history? Like, we had to fight an eldritch monster in Metroid Prime, and now it's just like the most boring I'm you but evil thing imaginable. This hit so much harder when Metroid Fusion came out a couple years earlier with one of the most interesting clone characters in all of Nintendo's library. But while I'm here for the plot and world building, you probably aren't. So how does the rest of the game hold up? Well, initially, it's your standard Metroid fare, which is great if you ask me. But then the game asks you to travel across the entire map with zero signposting to pad out the game. That's a real pace breaker. And then on top of that, it begins forcing you into the Dark World, which is even more padding that reuses the same maps, but now they're darker and force you into even more combat, which has never exactly been Metroid's strong suit. I was about ready to mark this off as one of the few bad Metroid games as I traversed from Grey Desert Wasteland to Black Palette Swamp to Brown Swamp and back again until finally I reached the cliffs. The cliffs are one of the greatest areas in any Metroid game ever. Their aesthetic is absolutely incredible. The gameplay is self-contained and filled with dynamic fights and interesting puzzles. From there, we finally got to a more interesting fight, mechanically if not lore-wise, with the Ing Queen before a bombastic escape sequence. In summation, Metroid Prime 2 has a strong start and an even stronger end, but when taken as a whole, it sums up lacking in nearly every area compared to its predecessor. If you're not a Metroid fan, you're really not missing much by skipping this one. But if, like me, you are a Metroid fan, it's just great to get more Metroid-y goodness, and the cliffs were worth the price of admission alone. Lost in Blue is a game so special that I made an entire Stories That Matter video on it. Finally pushing through and beating it was really a special experience for me. This game has a number of flaws, but none of them could remove the sense of childlike wonder and longing for adventure this game reignited in me. I recommend my video on the subject if you want to see my fuller thoughts on it, but for now, just know that after 10 years of waiting, it lived up to all my expectations. And finally, I want to wrap up with my top and bottom games of the year. There are going to be a lot of recognizable names on both sides, so I hope we can still be friends after this. <laughs> oh boy, do I have a lot of things to say about Nier Automata. Automata Pia! Okay, I'm sorry, I'm done. First off, I should preface that Yoko Taro's plots have never really been to my taste, so the deck was already stacked against him. I'm just not the target audience for the type of game he wants to tell. But this game was getting so much praise and Platinum was involved, so I wanted to give it a shot. For me personally, I tend to find his plots needlessly obtuse without there being a real worthwhile reward for bothering to unwind it. Without getting into spoilers, I'll just say this story is filled with twists and turns that I didn't ever feel amounted to anything interesting or managed to recontextualize the story in a meaningful way. I guess the least spoilery example I can give is early on you discover that the robots who have been begging for their lives or screaming rage-filled threats actually have emotions or something very close to them. This development just didn't hit home for me. Even if it wasn't obvious from the outset, it's not like I can actually spare them. It doesn't change the fact that they charge at me with intent to kill, completely unprovoked, every time I enter an area. I get that the point it's making is that pain and violence in a world system set up as it is are inevitable, but I just didn't feel that was a particularly meaningful insight. The philosophical references are just that too. References. I don't feel they tie into the overall narrative in any compelling way, and most of the time the game just asks well-worn questions and doesn't really bother to even try and point to answers, implying that you should just find your own. And the overall philosophy just didn't click with me. Sadly, I also felt the gameplay was a lot less engaging than other Platinum titles like Revengeance or Bayonetta, and while this wouldn't be a problem for a short 20 hour or less game, the course of the nearly 40 hours it took me to finish Automata, I just felt it was stretched a little bit too thin. I have a rule about writing. If your story can mean anything, then it means nothing. If you enjoyed this game, I think that's cool. I always like that there are things that people can enjoy that I don't. but. If you were playing this because you care about any of the philosophical ideas this game mentions and have similar tastes to me, I actually recommend you check out basically any work by C.S. Lewis instead. I realize that's not a game, but his writing just handles these ideas with a lot more brutal honesty and also a lot more substantial hope. If you just want something to hack and slash, Devil May Cry or Metal Gear Rising are much better in terms of gameplay. And if you want a game that has better and more interesting uses of philosophy, well, stick around for my game of the year. 
For all that didn't stick with me, I do really have to commend the amazing soundtrack. Listening to the wonderful songs made even the parts I found substantially unenjoyable fairly bearable. Heck, it's not like you need to go far to find a good opinion of this game, I realize my take's pretty unpopular, but if you do want a second opinion on it, I really recommend checking out Klimp's series on Automata. While I didn't enjoy the game, his breakdown of it is both funny and more intriguing than even an actual playthrough. Personally, I recommend this as a substitute for actually playing the game, but your mileage may vary. Dark Souls 3 is like the Dark Souls of the Dark Souls trilogy. All joking aside, this is the final form of the Souls series as far as I'm concerned. Games 1 and 2 had their moments, but both were too janky, too pointlessly obtuse, too slow, and dull with their combat to really grab me. Dark Souls 3 fixes nearly every problem I had with the original and its sequel. The combat's been sped up to a point where I was really engaged and actually had to use skill rather than fighting against boredom and falling asleep. Pointless platforming has all but been removed, and weapons have more skills and options, leading to more interesting on-the-fly play. The needlessly obtuse things are mostly relegated to extras and rather than being on the critical path, and while I still had to do a bit of grinding to get a few things, that's mostly because I was going to try to get all the endings, and had I chosen to play through normally, it would not have been required. This was the first Dark Souls game I considered fun from start to finish. The challenges are engaging, the level design is great, the only real drawback is the story is as meh as ever, but I know a lot of people enjoy the nihilistic item description, so I'm glad those people have something to enjoy here. If you were ever on the fence about Dark Souls, this is a great place to start if you ask me. Sonic Forces is my least favorite Sonic game. Not of the year, just ever. How they managed to take the formula Generations provided and make a game this bad is baffling. It stings even more given how it followed up the incredible mania. Just when Sonic was finally being redeemed in the eyes of the public, Forces comes along and makes sure no good game will ever go unpunished. Look, I'm sure in the grand scheme of Sonic there are worse games out there, but none of them, not even 06, stung me this bad and gave me so little enjoyment. The bugs are the worst the series has ever been. I died more from randomly falling through the floor than any intended obstacle. Honestly, I think every single Sonic game has something it does that's entertaining in a way only it can be. This is the first Sonic game I found nothing redeemable in. Not even entertainingly bad, it's just... bad. It really feels like Sonic has finally become the living joke everyone accused him of being. And it's left me wondering where I stand with the series and if I can even call myself a fan anymore. If it weren't for Mania, I don't think I could. Celeste is one of those games that actually lived up to the hype. $20 seemed rather steep for such a short platformer to me, but the Switch library is rather thin at the time, so I bit the bullet and purchased it. I was treated to a game that tested my platforming skills to their absolute limit, and told a shockingly heartfelt story about a girl trying to come to grips with this new stage in her life. It's nothing groundbreaking, but the story in this short little platformer is shockingly effective. It manages to contextualize the game into an experience that's more than just an electronic toy. Throughout the charming story, I came to really empathize with Madeline, and while not perfect, the conclusion her arc reaches felt satisfying rather than condescending. Its accessibility options ensure that no matter what your skill level, you can beat this game. But for those who want a tough-as-nails challenge, this game provides that in spades. I have a confession to make. I love RPG Maker horror games. They're usually not the cream of the crop in story or presentation or even gameplay, but they often belie a real passion project. People usually make games like these because they have a story idea they wish to present, but just like the skills to make a different kind of game. I love seeing these unfiltered passion projects because you get a lot of off-the-wall and unique experiences because of them. Angels of Death reminded me that unique is not the same thing as good. There's virtually no gameplay in Angels of Death, but I'm actually okay with that. Games like these exist to tell a sort of story rather than excite with mechanical complexity. Sure, the good ones usually have some simple puzzles or branching paths to keep it interesting, but it's not exactly a requirement. So, if we're not here for the gameplay or presentation, then it's up to the story and characters to pick up the slack. And oh my gosh, do they not even slightly hold up. The initial setup is intriguing enough. A girl wakes up in your typical death game basement and asks the first killer she meets to murder her. Neat. So, where does this go? Honestly, nowhere. The game ends with her still asking to be murdered by the same serial killer without any real growth or development. In the place of development is the revelation that she killed her family in self-defense and thinks that the Bible says her sins could be absolved if someone murders her? I don't think you have to be a Christian to know that that's not even almost what the Bible says or implies anywhere in it. The character arcs are just non-existent. The story doesn't even bother to make sense. 
the only thing it has going for it are a couple of unique character designs and the atmosphere just fails to pull you in. The characters are all certifiably unlikable and all of that's ignoring the glaring fact that the game actively glorifies and encourages suicide and suicidal behavior, and even has characters bond with it as some sort of perverse sign of affection. Look, games like Nier may shout what I feel is ultimately meaningless philosophy to my annoyance, but at least that doesn't encourage any sort of self-harm. Even if Angels of Death was telling a beautiful and moving story, and it isn't, it's glorifying suicide and it actually has a harmful message to send to a crowd who likely struggle with depression and would be drawn to this sort of game. It fails as a game, it fails as art, and it most certainly fails as a story, trying to send any sort of meaningful message. Few games can squeeze a one star out of me. Most of them are games that just are broken or waste my time or offered nothing but bad and vague philosophies. Nothing in all my playtime has ever presented such a damaging and poorly told moral as this game, and I genuinely think the world would be a better place without it in it. If you're looking for some sort of alternative, I suggest 999, also called the Nonary Games on Steam, for your death game fix, and something like Eeb or Corpse Party for your schlocky RPG Maker horror fix. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is as uniquely wonderful as it is rare. It evoked a sort of childlike wonder that's exceedingly difficult for me to find in games as an adult. It's a game that sucked me in and wouldn't let go. It's also a game that, despite being 80 hours minimum, I felt compelled to beat twice in 2018. This game absolutely deserves its own stories that matter. So for now, all I can say is that Xenoblade 2 was so good that I struggled to find any other games I even wanted to play this year. This game reminded me why I love games so much. The most shocking thing was, going in, I was convinced I'd hate it. I never enjoyed a Xeno game before, and to be frank, the theme seemed a little uninspired and often looked to get in the way of cohesive and interesting storytelling with relatable characters and satisfying arcs. Xenoblade 2 seemed to finally pull away from some of the less interesting themes of older games like Gnostic mysticism, and instead focused primarily on characters. Combine that with the more interesting philosophical focus of themes pulling heavily from Plato, and add just a splash of anime nonsense, and you have a game that I absolutely adore. While it's not perfect, grinding for cores is a little duller than obtaining them through the side missions, and some of the skimpier outfits take a while to look past to take the plot seriously, I still can't recommend this enough to anyone who enjoys story-driven games. The gameplay is layered and complex enough for plenty of self-expression, while still allowing for challenges that require hyper-optimization. The difficulty options alone are the stuff of legend. I can't recommend this game enough. If you have a Switch, I consider it THE killer app for the system, and I think you're unlikely to find an experience to rival it anytime soon. Well, that was my 2018 in gaming. While I had to shuffle through a lot of okay at best and even downright miserable games, it was completely worth it to get gems like Celeste and Xenoblade. Games like these provide that unique blending of story and gameplay you just can't get in any other medium, and they got me through a lot of sickness, both physical and mental. I can't thank God enough for stories like these that just touched me so deeply. Hopefully something on this list will touch you too, or at least give you an idea of what to steer clear of if you think anything like me. My name is Dolan Molna, officially signing in for 2019, and while I do still plan on covering the books and anime that I watched last year, next time we're going to be diving a bit deeper into some more analytical reviews. I hope you have a great day. God bless. I'm Sam, but it's tricky to read. I'm right, but it's closer to me.